we're so pleased to have you here tonight. Um, you know, we had two months on site at Mechanics Institute, uh, but we're really pleased to welcome you back virtually. Uh, and it's just great to see so many of you have returned. Uh, we've missed you. Um, I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute. Uh, just for those of you who are new, uh, tonight we have so much going on. We have a, a very special guest, author and film critic, uh, formerly of the San Francisco Chronicle, Ruth Stein, uh, who Matthew Kennedy will be introducing. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with Ruth and also about the film, A Single Man, and also have time for you to uh, ask questions of Ruth and also ask questions about the film and put in your comments as well. Um, also, great thanks to um, our CinemaLit uh, coordinator, Pam Troy, who's been working behind the scenes to quickly move us from on-site back to uh, a Zoom format. And we'll stay on Zoom this month to be safe. We want everyone to be in good health. Um, and so once again, uh, welcome back to Cinema Lit and take it away, Matthew Kennedy, our host and curator. Thank you, Laura. And thank, and it's just delightful to see so many friends and familiar faces in little Zoom boxes again. We have missed you. And um, we have a very full evening tonight because this is not just a movie discussion, as Laura mentioned. We have a special guest star who will be talking about her book in connection with the film you saw this week. And I also wanted to give you a heads up uh, a little bit about our programming this month back on Zoom um, that starting next week, we will go in a very different direction from tonight and have a three film, three week tribute to the great Barbara Stanwyck. And you might recall that we started a pre-code Barbara Stanwyck <laughs> series along just before lockdown number one, um, and we couldn't complete that. We're not doing her early films, however. We're doing sort of her three films from her, her um, mid-career. And so um, on next Friday, we will be discussing, and they're all on Canopy, of course, uh, next week we'll be, we will be discussing Stella Dallas, and on uh, January 21st, we'll be uh, featuring Meet John Doe, an interesting Frank Capra populist comedy drama. Um, and then the last film we'll be seeing is uh, the really interesting twisted film noir, The Strange Love of Martha Ivers. So all of the information and signing up and so forth is available on the website, uh, including uh, you know, further information on the films themselves and so forth. So please come back um, while, you, you know, while, we're, while we're in this format. And so I will move now into our, the, 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 the main point of this evening, which is to welcome our guest, um, Ruth Stein, who, as Laura mentioned, was a uh, film columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle. She didn't mention, however, the time span, which is truly extraordinary, 1970 to 2020. And in that period, Ruth interviewed a fantastic array of movie people. And that is really the, the basis, I believe, of her book. Um, and actually, I, Ruth is much would be much better at just at, the backstory about that than I am. So um, what we're gonna do tonight is uh, Ruth and I are gonna have a brief questions and answers uh, about the book and so forth. And then we're going and the, and the film and, and the, the section on the book devoted to Colin Firth. And then we're gonna open, up, open it up to the group. And I, I wanna um, mention that we wanna, we, we need to sort of think of this in two parts. And one would be, Questions specifically for Ruth about the book, which I'd like to sort of address with the group first. Uh, and then we would follow into questions about, for, with Ruth and or, and or me about, or anyone, about the film itself. So we've got a lot to cover, right? We have, we have Ruth the guest, Ruth the author, uh, uh, the film itself. And so 
with all of that, I would like to again, welcome Ruth, um, who I believe wants to uh, open, uh, you'd like to open your comments with a uh, special tribute. Thank you. Uh, on top of everything else, uh, as you all probably know by now, Sidney Poitier died today at age 94. Um, I was very struck by these people who have these incredible careers and then they retire or they stop making movies. And sadly, you don't hear about them again until they die. But I did have the great pleasure in 1980 of interviewing Mr. Poitier. And I thought it might be nice as a tribute to an elegant, lovely man for me to read you at least part of what I wrote in my book. Um, uh, just, you know, just briefly, the, the essays in the, in the book are, are a lot more than just my interviews from the Chronicle. I basically went back and remembered what all these people were like and told all the stuff that I hadn't told for various reasons in my interviews, um, sometimes because it wasn't very flattering, um, sometimes because it just didn't fit in, it was too much about me. So this book is very much um, more of a, a memoir, my memoir remembering these people than it is just the interviews that some of you may have read in the Chronicle over the years. So this, is, this interview took place in San Francisco. Sidney Poitier speaks slowly and deliberately, parsing each word. So it's hard to tell whether he's paused for effect or has answered my question, meaning I should jump in with another one. Transcribing our interview, I wince during each long silence, recording my indecision. But Poitier has an amazing story to tell, and I make the right decision to let him tell it at his own speed. It's the story of growing up indigent, the son of an impoverished tomato farmer on Cat Island, a remote part of the Bahamas, and going on to become, in 1964, the first African-American to win a Best Actor Oscar for his performance in Lilies of the Field. In his early 50s, Poitier decides to write an autobiography of this life. The book is raw and honest, traits not usually found in memoirs. I ask if he feels exposed revealing his tumultuous love affair with Diane Carroll, who broke up his first marriage, and the emotional conflicts that led him to nine years of psychoanalysis. What I reveal about myself is quite acceptable to me, in fact, I think it's terrific that people know me better because I like the me they will get to know, he replies. The person is far more complex than any of the parts assigned to Poitier. He arrived in the United States as a teenager with nothing except a burning desire to succeed. I'm just thoroughly charming. That's why I made it, he says, flashing one of his many mischievous smiles during our hour long interview. He might have added thoroughly handsome as well with intense deep set eyes, high cheekbones and a perfectly sculpted face. There are many other black actors, but none of them are nearly as interesting as I am. Sure, I was in the right place at the right time, but without my kind of personality, those other forces wouldn't have mattered. Poitier credits his mother, a very sensitive, remarkable woman with teaching him survival skills at an early age. For instance, she used to make pants for me out of flour sacks. And on my butt was written, New England flour, 98 pounds, milled in Cheshire, England. It was a mark of poverty, but she always would insist that it was only a negative mark if I didn't keep my pants clean. He learned to survive not just poverty, but success as well. In the late 1960s, after being chosen the number one box office star, Poitier suffered a backlash from black people in the film industry who dismissed him as an Uncle Tom, Tom and he used a highly pejorative phrase for a black man on the payroll of whites. I felt awful about it, and there was a tendency to want to lash out at my critics, he recalled. Instead, I laid open my life and my career to myself, and I said, what's there not to like? What's there to be ashamed of? I had to keep reinforcing me in order that I could stand strong against this tide that didn't seem to have any ending. And it's probably one of the reasons why he did retire relatively young from acting. He was really still in his 50s, although he did direct a few films after that. Um, so I, I've had the most privileged career, I think, of almost anyone. Well, maybe not a president or something, but as certainly anyone in, in the entertainment world. Uh, because, because as, as Matt had mentioned, I was able for 50 years to do these interviews. So I go back in my interviews to Faye Ray and Josephine Baker. Now I'm not that old. So I talked to those people towards the end of their careers. 
uh, but it's still sort of spectacular. My, my colleague, Nick LaSalle, whom you all know, said, what about D.W. Griffin? Didn't you interview D.W. Griffin? <laughs> no, I missed him. Uh, but but I, I, did, I, did, I, I did talk to an incredible range of people, including Princess Grace and Liza Minnelli and Audrey Hepburn and, and Cary Grant and uh, uh, Robin Williams was one of my favorites and just really this huge range and so many interviews that, I, that to tell you the truth, I had a hard time picking 100 out of them. Um, I should mention that this book came about I and mean, people have been telling me for years because I tell all my stories about my wonderful Al Pacino story. I'll just tell that one. And, but, I, but I've amused many people at dinner parties with these stories. Um, I walk into the room and Al Pacino is like, he's opening up the shades and he's turning off the lights and he's like all over the room. And he says, well, next I'm going to paint. And then he pays his, att his attention to me and those wonderful brown eyes. And he looks at me and says, have we met before? You look familiar. And you know how you sometimes think of the right thing to say an hour later? Well, I thought of the right thing to say right then and there. And I looked back into those brown eyes and I said, really, you look familiar too. <laughs> so I've been dining out on the stories and, and people said, put them in a book, make a book. I couldn't figure out what the book would be. I didn't want to just repeat my interviews. Uh, but then COVID came and I have to think that this is the only good thing in my life that came out of COVID. Um, I teach at the Fromm Institute, and as some of you may know, I run the Mostly British Film Festival, which I created about 14 years ago. Um, so I'm a very busy girl year round, but suddenly I didn't want to do the Fromm thing on Zoom, so I decided to delay it. We had to cancel our festival, and I was suddenly faced with really, for the first time in my life, nothing to do. And I'm not a good person with nothing to do. I, I get very antsy, you know, and um, so th that some, seemed like the right time to think about the book. And, and what I did is every night, I, 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 wrote, I wrote one person a day, a hundred, so it was a hundred days. And, and so the night before I would decide who I was gonna write the next day. And I would try to sleep and th think in my dreams and try to imagine things. And I'd wake up in the morning and I found I had the most incredible memory about things that had happened. 40 or 50 years ago, again, things that were not in my stories, but that were back in my memory bank. Um, and it just came pouring out. Um, I, I really spent maybe just took me a couple of hours uh, to write each one of, of the pieces that of course they were edited and uh, other things were added. I put in some PSs for things that really weren't part of my, my interview, but which were amusing to, to add to the story. Um, and I had, I had the most fun. So, and that's why I think of it in a way as my memoir, because I'm not going to write my memoir. I haven't really had that outside of my career. I've had a pretty normal, very nice life, but, but not enough for a memoir. Although I don't know, some of the people writing the memoirs these days, I'm not sure that's true. But um, so I think of this as, as a memoir because I was remembering my past, remembering things that had happened to me, remembering people. And, uh, um, and we got this book together in, in record time between the time I made a deal with the publisher. It was published, I think, nine months later, which for the, those of you who know anything about the publishing business is, is very, very fast. And I have to say, um, I hope some of you will, will be interested enough to get the book, which is available on Amazon. Very easy. Just type in Sitting Down with the Stars, Ruth Stein, and it pops right out. Like but they this. did a beautiful job of putting, you, you hold it up, but they did a beautiful job <laughs> of putting it together. Um, someone asked me why did I pick that picture of Pierce Brosnan because I have I have several photos in there of me and Jerry Lewis and Janet Lee and Kim Novak and Robin and Robin Williams and but I picked this picture because it's really the only one where I look, can you hold it up again, Matt? So so, oh, so it's yeah. really the only one that looks like I'm working. The others are you know sort of more or less stage photos. And I also look like I just asked Pierce Brosnan a very piercing question not mm -hmm. to be made upon. And that he's <laughs> contemplating, he's contemplating the answer. And of course he's unbelievably handsome at this point in his life. And he's also a really nice man. So I was I was very happy to make the decision to put him on the cover. Um, and, and then they have on the side and all the people that I interviewed, and just to look at this quickly, Ginger Rogers, Faye Dunaway, Sophia Lauren, and Margaret Oprah, Shoy McLean, Daniel Craig, Matt Damon, and Omar Sharif, Mel Gibson, uh, 
John Woodward, Sid Charisse, Paul Newman, and on and on, Walter Matthau, and on and on and on and on. And, um, and as I say, these are the ones that I picked out of the, the many, many more that, that I had interviewed. Um, so the, I think the book has been selling well. People tell me they're really enjoying it. One of my friends said it's sort of like having a box of raisins and you don't know whether you should just eat the whole box at once or pick out raisins and do it a little more slowly. So I had some friends who said that they sat down in two sittings and they read the whole book, which is great. And other people I obviously are just handpicking the people that they want to read about. And that's what's so good about the book because you, you can do that and you can just sort of keep it around. It's a good toilet book, if I may. If I may mention that, because you can just you can just sort of you know dip into it um, if, if you will, and I have them, um, I have them organized according to to different uh, like Hollywood royalty and what becomes a legend most, and I have couples and exes as one, and then I have the saddest chapter is the last one where I have people who died too young, and uh, that includes Philip Seymour Hoffman and. Wendy Houston and, and as I mentioned Robin Williams earlier and Heath Ledger and um, and that, that was looking back on those interviews was very bittersweet for me I have to say because I saw them being really alive and it's hard to think that they died so young so I think that pretty much is an introduction for I know you have a lot of questions you want to ask me so go go for it Ruth thank you very much and and uh, honestly this I, I want to vouch for the um I know this maybe isn't a positive word, but the addictive quality of this book because oh, a great word. <laughs> the the chapters are very brief and but they're enough to give you a sense of whatever it was that actor was working on at the time and some sense of their personality and the the you know the context of your interview. And I started by looking in the table of contents and saying, oh, I'll read this one and then I'll read that one, you know, and going back and forth. And I realized that ultimately. They were, I wanted to read them all. So then I just started going page by page and they go so quickly. And yet each one is this, its own little world that it, it makes for, uh, well, as I say, addicting. So find a comfy chair and a cup of tea and you know plan to spend some time uh, with this, this really fun read. And I wanted to ask just a few questions before we, we sure. open it up to the group and they're, they're kind of maybe somewhat predictable, but you know, things like, like certain things about certain interviews that really stand out to you, like, um, well, like the, out, the, if you, what was the most outstanding interview for one reason or another? If well, you I don't know if there was just one, but there were moments in, in the, one that comes to mind, uh, particularly now is the day I interviewed Chris Rock was the day of President of Obama was inaugurated for the first time as president. And we were both at Sundance and we both, realized that we really wanted to see Obama being inaugurated. More, I mean, we were gonna to talk to each other later and everything, but we were looking at each other. So we found a room that had a television set. And what was really dear is he called his mother. So I ended up watching President Obama be inaugurated with Chris Rock and his mother. And it was oh, that's very, sweet. very touching. Yeah, story. yeah, yeah. No. And here's, here's a story that's not so sweet. Um, one of the things you, you try to avoid as a journalist is to be interviewing a person who's been slammed for whatever reason in your newspaper. Um, and I had the unfortunate <laughs> um, bad timing of talking to Kirk Douglas, uh, who after he stopped acting, thought he was a writer and he wrote a novel. It was a very sort of sexy novel about a, a romance between these two actors, an actor and an actress. And it, it had just gotten the worst review in the Chronicle. And I thought, well, maybe he didn't see it. I mean, after all, he's a busy man, he's not reading the Chronicle, but no such luck, he saw it. And he's, he, he was really angry at me. And I, you know, I, and I had to say, you know, I had nothing to do with that. And he said, well, I'm gonna tell you something. He said, I know you're not gonna answer me, but I know that review was written by a lesbian because she clearly did not understand an, uh, what sexual relationship was like between a man and a woman. Um, and I said, well, well, you're right. I'm not gonna answer you. But also he was right about who wrote the review. Um, so that, that was a very awkward uh, moment, but he did sort of calm down. Um, another hothead was Tony Curtis, who seemed, you see, when you talk to people at the end of their career, you get unexpected things out of them. He was very unhappy with his career. He, he mentioned that he started out with Marlon Brando and look at the parts that Brando got and the parts that I got. And he was often made fun of, there was that line, uh, yonder lives the palace of my father. My father, yeah. Right, 
which he claims he never said, but that he was made fun of for his accent and made fun of, and he sort of hinted maybe there was some anti-Semitism involved in this. And so I had to listen to him kind of unreal. And then to add, to make it even worse, the photographer was also a hothead and uh, right in the middle of him taking pictures, Tony Curtis decided he didn't like the angle he was being shot from. And the two of them always got into a fist fight and I had to break it up. <laughs> so there, were, there were odd moments. Vicki Rooney, was, who was, uh, had also written his memoir. That's, that was how I got to talk to some of these fantastic people was that they were at the stage in their life where, where they were writing you know, their autobiographies and, and everything. So Mickey Rooney kept me waiting for about 45 minutes. And those of you who remember when Mickey Rooney was a big star might remember that he was married seven or eight times. Uh, that was the other thing he was known for. So he walks in, he looks at me, he said, hello, have we been married? <laughs> and that kind of broke the ice. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there are things I, there are things I remember, the Faye, Faye Dunaway story. She, she, she has, had reputation for being very difficult and I was warned before I went in to talk to her that she doesn't like noise and I didn't know what that meant I mean I, okay I won't tap my foot but can I speak you know I wasn't I wasn't quite sure how how to, to handle that you know it, she she actually turned out to be not that horrible when I talked to her but there was a very funny story which was one of these pieces that I have at the end of some of the of the stories where Roman Polanski says that, that um, he got along with all of his actresses except for Faye Dunaway. And he said when he was shooting Chinatown, he noticed that she had a cowlick and, he, and, her, and she couldn't, it, it wouldn't like go down, you know? So he walked over to her and pulled her hair out. And he, and he said, she wanted to have a fight. Well, now she had a reason to have a fight. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there were, that, that, yeah, there were, there was a sort of, there were just sort of moments that I, that that really make me laugh when I think about them. <laughs> well, I, it's it's delightful to hear you sort of free associate from one to another. <laughs> I feel like I really don't need to ask you any questions. No, you no, just sort of, questions. no, no. I mean, I mean, this, you're, you're sort yeah, of. Actually, this, this reminds me of another story. Okay. Right. Because when I interviewed <laughs> Oprah, who I loved, she was just exactly as wonderful as you think that she would be, and and she wanted. I mean, I think she wanted to sort of level the playing ground by letting me know that she used to do the same job that I did. She started out in television uh, doing interviews for a local t TV station. So she, she, was, she, she was said she remembered when, um, when she interviewed uh, Priscilla Presley, they told her that not to ask questions about Elvis. And she said when she interviewed Elizabeth Taylor, they told her not to ask questions about any of her husbands. <laughs> so Oprah said, I want you to know you can ask me anything. <laughs> so I want you to know, Matt, that you can ask me anything. Oh, wow. Okay. But I will tell one, just to finish the Oprah story up, because this, this is not, this isn't just a memory, but I actually have it on tape. I said to her at the end, I said, you know, I don't get nervous because I've interviewed a lot of celebrities, but you're Oprah. And I have to admit, before I walked in here, I was feeling you know, a little few butterflies. And she took my tape recorder and she went like this. She said, Ruth, you did great. You did great. And so I have that on tape too. That's so, great. Yeah. So, um, you know, there, there's so many and there's so many ways to approach this. Uh, why don't we move into the uh, Colin Firth section? Absolutely. Which uh, is relevant to everyone who saw the film this week. Yes. And, um, and that's part of it. Um, and we wanted to specifically, by the way, we chose the film based on the fact that it got a fair amount of attention in your section. Some of your, yeah. some of your sections really aren't about the opening of a film or- Well, I try, I try not right. to as a but, writer because I always feel, I um, mean, this is just a journalistic thing, but our stories were always running Sunday before the movie opened. And I thought people really aren't that interested in the film until they've seen it, you know? So I tried to find other things to get people to talk about. So they weren't, I mean, they're there to plug their film. But I didn't always find that to be very interesting. But that wasn't true with Colin Firth because he had a very interesting take on, on, on the, the movie. And that's why I quoted him as much as I did about A Single Man. And I, I also have to say, I did watch it last part of it last night. And he talks in here, you'll hear, about how Tom Ford wanted to make sure he was really buff and in shape because he had Tom Ford had a certain image of what this guy was supposed to look like. And the truth is, Colin Firth, is, he's really good looking, but he's a little soft, you know? I mean, if you if you think about him with with Renee Zellweger and and some of the other parts, he, he he's not 
He's not someone who you imagine is at the gym every day, but he really did get himself in shape for that movie. And he was in unbelievable shape for that film. I mean, he took his clothes off and probably thought, well, I'll never look like this again. Why not? <laughs> um, so let, let's hear a little bit from Mr. Firth here. Uh, Colin Firth is unquestionably good looking, but his features are slightly off. His eyes set a tad too far apart, a prominent nose. He's no pretty boy. His imperfections afford flexibility in the kind of roles he can play. Firth was a heartthrob, of course, as Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice, where his emergence from a swim in a wet shirt sent female and probably some male hearts of water. Again, he plays a contemporary but no less sexy character named Darcy in Bridget, in Bridget Jones's Diary. But Firth also takes roles in which his sexuality is irrelevant, including a lonely, paranoid cinema owner, an M16 double agent, the artist, uh, Liam Muir, whom he says, I knew I couldn't capture the great man's genius. You can't play genius. I catch up with the English actor at the point where his career is about to deliver a one-two punch. He'd recently been nominated for his first Oscar for a single man portraying a gay professor contemplating suicide after the death of his longtime companion. He loses this time, but wins the following year for a sympathetic portrayal of King George VI, the monarch with an unfortunate stutter in the King's speech, of course. Firth confides to me that when he was a fledging actor in his early 20s, he had nothing but disdain for the Oscars. I thought they were unhealthy and bad for this profession. Acting to me is not a sport where we are put in competition with each other, but rather we should be more collaborative. But that was then. Now, dressed in jeans and a casual sweater in a Los Angeles hotel room, he's luxuriating in his single man nomination. I'm just not as earnest about things like that anymore. The 49-year-old 40, actress says of his change of heart. It's not like I made some great U-turn. I didn't, but I'm now a compromised middle-aged man. First laughs, rocking forward in an easy chair. He's easy to talk to now, but admits it, it took years to get used to the press sniffing around him. In his first brush with fame after Prime and Prejudice, paparazzi followed him home after he bought a vacuum cleaner. A headline in a British tabloid screamed, Mr. Darcy does the household chores. <laughs> Prior to the Academy Awards, his director, Tom Ford, the clothes designer of a luxury brand, deb debuting as a filmmaker, presented first with vintage gold cufflings and matching studs so he'd be sure to bring home something gold on Oscar night. Around the time I spoke to Firth, Ford was quoted saying he told his star he was fat and then he needed to do something about it. I laughed when I read that because I didn't hear Tom say that. If he said it, I blocked it out, Firth recalls. What I remember was pure honey. Tom bathed me in charm saying, you are looking great, absolutely, but you would look better if you were in better shape. I'll get you a trainer and I'll pay for it. A team consisting of Ford and his trainer appeared to have made over Firth to resemble the trim, meticulously turned out designer. Firth has never looked better on screen. His new body is such an improvement that he's attempting to adhere to his Pygmalion strict exercise regimen. Although Ford kept a tight rein on his actors, Firth felt he had enough freedom to build his character, George. It was a leap of faith for all of us that we could bring out the nuances. That George is gay was never a stumbling block. Listen, the first role I ever played was a gay man and it started my career. I played one in Mamma Mia and somewhere else I've forgotten. I'll play anything if the character is interesting. I'm not going to base it on what his sexuality is. So I, I thought, I watching the movie yet, like yesterday, I was just so struck again by him talking about how uh, Tom Ford wanted him to get in, in great shape and, and really in what great shape he, he is. And if any of you know what Tom Ford looks like, um, I, I'm really interested in fashion. So I've read stories about him and seen photos. He really did make him make make Firth look like him his, and his body type and everything. Um, so I, I found the movie uh, uh, is it's when you go back on a film that you haven't seen for years, you sort of see things that you didn't see before. And I, I found the movie very exacting. I mean, the, the way he honed in on Julianne Moore when she was putting on her eyelashes and trying to make herself look, you know, more beautiful. And the the scenes with the guns which were almost hard to watch i mean they were so uh, they, they, they just felt so real you know when he put a gun in his mouth and then the telephone rang and all these things are trying to to stop him and um it, it was a um it, it's kind of a jarring film and and 
sort of hard to watch in some ways, but then also very life fulfilling, you know, when he does meet someone else. But the scenes, the back scenes, when he was talk, looking back and how he had met um, the, uh, I met his lover, the, the guy who's just sets up the whole, the whole film. And then when he meets this young man again, and it almost seems like he's going to be able to start his life all over again with someone who was probably pretty close to the same age that Matthew Good was when he met him initially. So those are my those are my thoughts on on the second viewing of a single man. Well, there's um, why don't we thank you and and I think we can uh, bring out more of that with the crowd here. Uh, and why don't we open up the the uh, evening to questions and answers from from everyone and or anyone who wishes to and uh also if we could maybe focus on the book first and then and then the film see if that if we can do that let's see how that goes but um uh pam you wanted to uh review the protocol for okay for, for everybody who's, for some people may be new here but i as, as and i know that there are people who already know how we do this but what you, what you do is you raise your hand. If you look down in the lower, um, if you look down into the lower part of your screen, you click on participants. A list of everybody who's here will come on, and you'll see there is one of the one of the uh, possibilities, one of the options is for you to raise your hand. When you do that, a blue hand appears in your upper left corner of your Zoom. As you can see, Trish has already done it because she's got a blue hand up. And Matthew will call on you in the order you raise your hand. Now, just I want to remind everybody, um, we have a whole lot of people. We have a we have more people than usual uh, here. So um, try to keep all of your comments to the point. And um, we're going to try and give everybody who wants to a chance to talk. So um, if you have, if you if you've spoken and then something you think of something and you raise your hand, we will wait until everybody else, you know, everybody who's not spoken has spoken before we'll call on you again. So this, I hope this is clear. Um, if anybody has any questions, go into chat and send me a private uh, email, send me a private chat and I'll answer any questions you have, so. All right, thank you, Pam. And we, uh, first up is Trisha. Hi, everybody. Hello, Trisha. Hi, Hi, Trisha. Hi, hi. It's so good to see everyone. Um, um, I just, you know, I used to be a journalist and, a review, and interviewed people through my life. And I was thinking as you were speaking um, that um, um, generally, I think I, I, I probably, sh you seem like the person I share this characteristic of just curiosity about people, which is a great yeah. thing because I mean, you could set me down in a bus station and I'll be, somebody will be talking to me and I find out their whole life story, you know, and I just love to find out about people. But it occurred to me, um, working for the Cron as you did with that assignment, did you ever, I mean, I, I was trying to think, I think in once time, one time in my life, I interviewed somebody and it just, it, there was no matter where I came at the person from, it was just so, it was, it was kind of this boredom there was this person, you know, and I was thinking in in the terms of movie stars, they're so interesting. We tend to think that maybe they're like they're, they're not all they're not all so interesting. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Their, <laughs> their screen character can be so intriguing, right? But and, they, and then yeah. we, like Helena Bonham Carter struck me that way when she's been interviewed as herself. Anyway, I just wondered for yourself. Oh, she's fascinating. I, I oh, is she? Because when she was on Letterman or whatever, she never, oh. you know, she was she was great because you know. Um, you, you see so many actors taking their clothes off and it's a somewhat difficult question to ask, but I had the feeling that she would be up for it and she'd answer the question. And she was, and she had this absolutely wonderful answer. She said, I felt totally silly. I couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> and I just love that. No, no, she's, she, I thought she was, I thought, I found it to be pretty interesting. She's in the I, book, by the way. In the book, yeah, the so book. my yeah, question is, is there the somebody book. that you look back on who, you know, you were so excited to meet because they seemed so vital on the screen, but when you met them, they weren't quite, they didn't yeah, quite look yeah. up to you. Yeah, well, Phil, I had a difficult time with Phil Seymour Hoffman, who I have actually interviewed twice. Um, I found him, he, he seemed to be putting me down about my questions. Um, he, he didn't, he, if, one thing, I hate doing interviews over lunch, but he was, he had just flown in from somewhere and he's somebody who ate a lot, I think. And so he insisted on 
having breakfast and he was, he, I mean, he had so much food in front of him and he was spitting out food when he was talking. So it was very distracting. Uh, but but he, he thought my questions about, the, it was a very weird movie called Schenectady, New York or something that he made. I don't, know if I, I don't know if anybody even knows it anymore. And it was a very odd movie. And I said that I thought it was a typical movie and he attacked me over that. He, it was it was just a very unpleasant interview mm. and, it, and and i and i did go through this twice because i had talked to him uh, a couple of years earlier when he was doing some television interviewing for, for politics where he sort of made me feel like i didn't like he knew all about politics and i didn't and i found him to be a difficult man and then i thought well he had this really um, crazy life and because he was doing so many things he was he had a theater company in New York and he was directing for the theater in London at the same time he was making a movie in, in Los Angeles. And I wondered if all the drug use was in part just to be able to keep going. And maybe his even being so hungry and eating so much was just, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't you know, I'm a fairly energetic person, but looking at all the things that he did exhausted me. So I, I, I did wonder if that, if that was part of it, but, but I, it, was, I, it was not a pleasant time. And I was very happy when that interview was over. And of course, sad when, when he died and now his son is in a movie and licorice pizza. So it's, it's sort of interesting to see mm. the ways in which he's like his father, um, in the way the, on screen, I mean. Um, so th th yeah, he was difficult. Whitney Houston also was not an easy interview to say the very least. You know, sometimes, um, when you interview someone of, of color, they, there's a, there, there, there can be a, they make you feel like you don't really understand what you're saying because you're not. Um, as it happened, I have a, had a somewhat unusual background in journalism because my first job was with Ebony and Jet and I worked in an all black environment for a couple of years where I was not only the only white person, but also I was the only woman. So, and I interviewed a lot of black stars who were coming through, who came to Johnson Publishing Company. So it wasn't even true, you know, that, that I didn't understand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not claiming that I understand what black people go through. I, I would never say that, but I have had some experience interviewing a lot, lots and lots of, of black people in my lifetime. Um, but, but she was just treating, and I didn't, I didn't throw that out there, but she was just treating me like, you know, what do you, what are you a little white girl? What, you know, what do you know about me? And, and uh, turns out nobody really knew much about her because, you know, look at the horrible way that she died. She was supposed to be at the Grammy Awards and, and, and you know, and then she just accidentally killed herself uh, with drugs and, and, and all that. So those, those two people who, who coincidentally, both of whom died young, um, I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's he, good to know yeah um, on the other hand he, he led you was lovely and he also died young he, he was just a, a total sweetheart so it wasn't it, was, it wasn't all the not all those people in, in that chapter in my book of downers so. thank you ruth ruth I, I appreciate that you're not reticent i mean i know that you're not in the book but also in in talking with us tonight because i mean often when people talk about well-known people they there's a there can be a tendency to put on the brakes like well, I'm not going to say what I really you know yeah. think or whatever and I, I I feel like you know you're you're being a, a true journalist and sharing what what they shared with you so I, I thank you for that yeah yeah because um, I wrote about it too and right and I didn't I didn't want I mean it wasn't just because those people were dead I mean that I would have written the same thing if, if they right. hadn't died. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and Robin Williams, who I interviewed several times, and I just loved. I mean, I was so sad when he died, and he just was. He just was such a, a sweetheart and so funny. I mean, he would grab your tape recorder and just start telling a whole bunch of jokes. You know, those are the tapes all my friends wanted to hear afterwards. <laughs> Uh, so no, I, I mean, I, I really felt with this book that I had to be honest about the people that I talked to and, and, you know, how I felt about them. And, and, you know, they weren't, they weren't all piece of cake as I, you know, right, I said. Right. Um, and, and, but we wouldn't expect them to be, I would. Um, it would have been a pretty boring thank you. book if they, they, if they had all mm -hmm. been like that. So Paul, let's, uh, you're up. Hello, Paul. Okay. Could you tell us uh, uh, something about the, um, interviews that you did that you decided not to include in the book? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, first of all, I had to remember everyone that I interviewed. It was easier after 1995 because the Chronicle uh, 
started digitalizing everything. So I could just say Rustein, so-and-so, and they would come up, you know. But the people before that, I had to remember who I, I mean, it's not like I forgot that I interviewed Princess Grace or Cary Grant, but but they, but those things had somewhat become like dreams. And I really wondered if it was even true. And it wasn't until I saw the story that I was, right, I was in Cary Grant's dressing room and I was in the palace with Princess Grace. Uh, but some of the people that I left out, okay, I left out Sandra Bullock, who's actually very funny, but she talks a mile a minute. And I had the hardest time transcribing that tape and I didn't feel that in my story, I had enough really coherent quotes from her because I, I couldn't keep up with her. I think she was doing it because she wanted to give me more stuff, but, but it, I'm a very fast typist, but not nowhere near as fast as she was a talker. So that was one person who didn't get in there because of that. Um, some people, I, they just faded from memory. Um, so, I, so even when I looked up the story, like Joanne Moore, who's, who's it's just very very sweet girl I remember we were we were stuck in this hotel room and she offered me a piece of gum which is probably the only thing I've ever been offered by any star ever in my, my 50 years and she was very very nice but she just kind of I don't know she just kind of blanked out when I tried to remember things about her besides the offering him this, the stick of gum um <laughs> I mean, I, I've had other things this is this is someone I did include in my book but I've had other really funny Things happen uh, 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 like um, one actress uh, actually blew on me and wanted to know whether she, she had bad breath. <laughs> I had it. I had her sure that she was. Fine. I, I'll, I'll leave her name out, although it's mentioned in the book if you if you if you read it. Um, so who else did I did I not do? I mean, some some people I literally forgot because they didn't make that much of an impression on me. Um, oh God! I mean, I I I, I, I talked to. Some some of the younger people um, in the business they they didn't really stick out much when I was when I was thinking about who to tell stories I had to include Timothy Chalamet because he's so hot right now but but there were others uh, uh, what, what was it, Toby McGuire he was kind of a zero when I interviewed him and uh, uh, some of the other, some of those other people Hugh Jackman was not very. I mean, he was, you know, he was fine. He answered my questions and everything, but he, he didn't, he didn't really stick in my memory. So that this process I was talking about where I sleep on and then I remember all these things that went on. I couldn't remember what much that went on beyond what was in my interview with, 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 with Hugh Jackman. I mean, I'm not, I'm not criticizing these people. I'm just saying, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow was, was kind of like that too. She just wasn't, you know, she just wasn't, I, who, I didn't know she was going to become this huge mogul you know, on the internet, I never would have thought it even because she didn't seem to me like she was could have sort of figured all that stuff out. Well, um, is there is there something? I mean, this is this is sort of unrelated to the book in the you know the choices that you didn't uh, include, but is there some sort of through line in interviews that don't seem very inspired? I mean, when I've interviewed folks, I've always the 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 interviews that aren't exciting are the ones in which I feel every answer is canned where yeah, i'm not really yeah. learning anything uh, you know, they're very I'm, guarded right so yeah. this, is, this is why you have to do a lot of research when you when you, I'm, I'm not really talking about interview techniques like i went to a journalism class or something but it is true that that the more research you do the better off you are in terms of talking to them first of all they're flattered but when i was interviewing charlton heston i realized that he was giving me the answers that i had already read in 10 different articles he had given. And I actually said to him, okay, tell me something you haven't told anybody else. Um, I didn't include him in the book and, and it wasn't really political, but I think people have sort of forgotten him. I mean, that's the other thing. I, I, tried, to, I tried to make people, even, even those who have been gone for a long time, but you know, like everyone remembers Ginger Rogers and, and of course, Princess Grace and all these people. But there are a lot of people who, who I talked to over the years who sort of been forgotten and I didn't think that they would be that interesting in, in the book because I didn't think people would, would really want to. Mm -hmm. There was a reason they were sort of forgotten. I mean, it's shocking when you think about all the actors that I've interviewed who, you know, who, who never really who made maybe one other movie after that. They were they, like uh, Heather Graham was one of them and, and Natalie Wood's daughter, Natasha Gregson. I mean, they, um, so, they, so they just didn't, you know, I, I just didn't think people would be interested in knowing about them. So they try, I tried to include people that, 
Um, even Mel Gibson, as awful as he turned out to be, I think people were interested in him. They wanted to know what he was like. Um, and, and I pretty much, he's pretty much exactly the way you think he is, he would be, you know, he had, he had his mates with him all on the table and they were kind of booing and hissing at some of the questions that I was asking. And, you know, so, then, but, so but I wanted to include him, you know, for, you know, for that reason, because I think people are interested in him. Um, Jeffrey Rush, who I, I did a very, very long interview with um, when he was first starting out. And, and I actually had the I actually had a lot of time to talk to him, but I don't think people really think that much about him anymore either, or, or, or are that interested mm -hmm. in reading about him. I mean, these were all judgment calls that I was making, but but um, but I think you know I think I picked the best hundred. I do. I, I, there's no one in well, there, and the only reason I interview Lonnie Anderson is because she badmouthed Burt Reynolds so much. That's <laughs> the truth. I would never have included her otherwise, uh -huh. but she had nothing good to say about Burt Reynolds. <laughs> So that makes so, a sort of spicy story. Well, and I, only, I only interviewed Joanne Woodward. I only included her because I, in the couple things I'd interviewed Paul Newman and it's sort of interesting how each one of them viewed their, their role as being a uh -huh. star. But she kind of faded away. And I guess she, she stayed home and raised her kids and she, she hasn't made a whole lot of movies. So I, on, her, on her own, I wouldn't have included her. But as part of my couple chapter, I, I, mm -hmm. I did, yeah. Well, it's fascinating. I mean, the list of people that you both inter you've interviewed in general and the ones that are included in the book become a kind of interesting um, consideration of the nature of fame and why fame endures for some and not for others once their careers are over and or they've died. Um, yeah, isn't it? I don't, there are no ready answers, but I find it. You know, I, find, I find the really elusiveness important. of fame or the the difficulty of maintaining fame. And, and how a legacy is endures interesting. Paul, Paul Newman, who was such a huge star, you know, in our generation, I had some some uh, pictures that I needed to have digitalized, you know, and I brought them down to some place out the market. And the guy said to me, who's that? And, I mean, Roy Paul Newman is honestly better known for his spaghetti sauce these days among younger right. people. Um, he, he just, he just, and I never would have figured that. Yeah, well, you know, with with a, with somebody like that, you can just say, "Go to aisle twelve and Safeway," and there's your answer. Yeah, you know? yeah like, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but so uh, uh, we have we have a couple of hands. Uh, let's uh, Michelle and Judy. Hi, hi, Ruth. Hi. hi. You used to hi, work Michelle. Hi, Judy. Out with you at the Chronicle. Your your book sounds great, and you look fabulous. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I'm seventy six. I always tell people that. Uh, what? Not even if they don't oh, ask, but, but I am. I'm 76. I'm proud of it. And my husband's 90, and he looks fantastic. He, you know, my, my husband is in yeah, the uh, yeah, former planning director uh, under three different mayors. Yeah, he yeah, seems like the best looking 90 year old. So more, more we're, years we're doing now. okay here. <laughs> and this Hi. is my friend Ju Judy. Hi, Hi. Ruth. Um, I, I appreciate your work for the English Film Festival every year. I really do. Thank you. It's been, we've, it's been really tough this year. We know we we're supposed to have it February 10th through the 17th. And last week I moved, I pushed it back to March. Yeah. Which took an incredible amount of work and rearranging things. Just keep my fingers crossed that by March, people will be wanting to go to, to the movies. I, you know, it's, I don't want to do a digital one because it's not our audience and it's not me and it's not what we're all about. So I didn't do it last year at all. And we were one of the last film festivals two years ago to be able to go on. But thank you for saying that. It's really a labor of love. And we have a great program this year. You all have to look on mostlybritish.org. We, 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 we're starting with a Helen Mirren movie called The Duke, which is, and, and, and Jim Broadbent, which is sort of like a Frank Capra almost kind of fantasy film. And it's, it's, just, it's just brilliant. And we're closing with a Beatles documentary, The Beatles in India, all about their time in India. And we've got a great program So everybody. This is, I wasn't going to plug this, but since you brought it up, mostlybritish.org, okay? <laughs> I do have a question. As, in your many years of interviewing and the many people that you've interviewed, what was probably, or do you have somebody that has been most surprising in your interview, even coming in there with some type of preconception of that person and then interviewing them and then saying, oh my God. And saying, you know, 
I didn't. Well, I, I'm I'm going to answer try to answer that question, but, but let me let me first uh, tw just tweak it a little bit to tell a funny story. Uh, when I interviewed Princess Grace, I I was invited to a concert at the palace, and I actually did the interview standing up at the party that she had in her private apartment, you know. Um, and she spent so much time talking to me and all of these people were all around and I thought, my God, she must just really enjoy talking to me. And I found out later that the people in Monaco think her French is awful and they make fun of her, make fun of her all the time. And so if anybody was talking English, that would be the person that she would glom onto and spend all their time with. So that was a little bit of a, a deflation for me. <laughs> um, so who, who, who did who who just totally surprised me? Hmm. Let me think about that. Um, I don't know that I, you know I I I had been so you know once again going back to this to the research and to being paying attention to these people's films and knowing a lot of these stars coming up. Oh, well, I, I know, no, here was somebody who, I, who I, I didn't like very much, but I don't know that I thought I would like her. I'm not sure, but I found Sophia Lauren to be sort of full of herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I, she, she, she was going around the country. She had a perfume. This is when Elizabeth Taylor had started, uh, um, okay. had, had started with, with, uh, with the perfumes named, named for them and, and, and everything. Um, so she, so I, you know, I said to her, logical question, I said, she was getting up at four o'clock in the morning to fly here and she was, she was at the Emporium. Sophia Lauren at the Emporium. So I said, why are you doing this? Is this, it, you must, they must be paying you a lot. And she got very upset at that. She was on, got on her high horse and she said, I would never do anything just for the money. I'm doing this for the challenge, the challenge of bringing together the fragrance that most, the most, <laughs> <laughs> that most smells like me. I mean, it's hard for me to start, not to start laughing. But yeah. anyway, so she, I didn't find her to be very pleasant at all. And mm. uh, um, so that that was, but I don't know, I don't know that I was surprised by that. Or pretty I mean, I was mostly, I, I mean, mo mostly, you know, there's a lot, the people that do what I do, we talk to each other a lot. I mean, sometimes we go on junkets and so, there's advanced word about everybody. I mean, everyone knows that Robert mm -hmm. De Niro was a terrible interview. Um, he's gotten better in recent years because he spoke out against Trump and he had, he had something he wanted to say and he went on television. But for years, he was the most bland interview you can imagine. And he would even make fun of himself. I think it was because he didn't want to reveal anything about himself. So people knew that. And they knew, they know that Daniel Day-Lewis and Ray Fiennes are wonderful people to interview. And so I have been sort of told these things. And when I went into those interviews, they both were wonderful to interview. Yeah. Yeah. Um, both very, uh, very interested in you or appearing to, at least they're good enough actors to appear to be interested in you. But I remember I was talking about the hippie world with Daniel Day Lewis because he'd made a movie directed by his wife, Rebecca Miller. You know, his wife yeah. is, is Arthur Miller's daughter. Yeah. Those kids must have incredible genes, though I can think of. But, uh, he, he was really interested because I was in San Francisco for the whole hippie thing. He wanted to know, you know, what was it really like and all that. But he was just so engaging. And, and, and Ray, Ray Fiennes is the same way. I mean, they're, they're, there's something about the British. They, they always sound so smart, you know. And I found that the Irish, I found that the Irish, uh, that I really liked a lot of Irish actors. I mentioned Pierce Brosnan and also, also Colin Farrell, who was just totally uninhibited. I mean, he swore like you wouldn't believe it, and he, and he talked about all the bullshit in Hollywood, and how you know I was going to deal with it. His publicist was like dying, you know, in the room hearing him talk. <laughs> because I loved it because he was just he was really himself, you know, and yeah. and uh, so I found that the Irish the Irish actors, a lot of them tend to be more humble, and the and the Brits just always sound like they're so smart. <laughs> I mean, they may not. So they're not all smart, but they sound like they, they sound really, smart. They, they sound yeah. smart, right? Uh, but we have another hand, and then we're getting close to seven o'clock, believe it or not. Um, uh, so <laughs> let's... we wanted to talk more about the film, right? Didn't you want to do? Yeah, we. And if there's any, if there are any comments we want to make about Thank about you. the film, in particular. But let's uh, let's hear from Richard. Good evening, Richard. Good evening, Richard. Oh, oh yeah. I want to ask a question. One of my favorite actors was. Tony Curtis, he had a huge career, 
uh, he made the Sex and the Single Girl. Yeah. And then he made The Great Race, one of my favorite movies with Jack Lemmon. And then I don't know what happened. I, my parents took me to, to the Joey Bishop show in Hollywood. He was interviewed and he said, I'm going to play Albert DeSalvio in uh, yeah, the Boston, Boston Strangler. Strangler. And then after that, you hardly ever saw Tony Curtis. Did something happen to him? Or well, I think he was. He, he, I didn't mention him earlier. Maybe maybe you weren't weren't here yet. But he, he was he was a very difficult interview. And and uh, he was as I mentioned, he was very bitter about his career. He felt that he he wasn't offered. He's great in Some Like It Hot too. We have to be sure to mention. Yeah, that, that was one. a really good. He, one. he was imitating Cary Grant, and he was fantastic. Um, but he felt that the good parts didn't really didn't come to him. And but part of it was just I, you know. I really have come to believe the more the more I got involved, the more I knew about Hollywood is that when actors are unpleasant and they, their, their box office isn't so great, people don't want to work with them. I mean, Demi Moore, was there a bigger star 15 years ago than Demi Moore? But she was awful. She was a bitch. She was mean to everyone. And suddenly she stopped making movies because people weren't going to her films. And so they, they, they didn't want to cast her. I mean, it's a very intense situation to be on a movie set and it, you're, you're with these people for several weeks. Um, you know, so really, uh, if, it's, if, it's at, if it's somewhere else in the world, you're sort of, you know, with them all day and eating all their meals. So why would you want to be around someone who was unpleasant? And I think Tom, Tony Curtis was kind of an unpleasant person. And he, he, he had like six marriages and his wives kept getting younger and younger. And, and I generally, who, who I interviewed and who I really, really like. And I have a nice, there's a very nice photo of her, me and her in there. I actually did an interview with her on the ACT uh, stage uh, for a, a film series that I did when I was at the Chronicle. And so I got to know her a little bit, but she would never say anything nasty about him because he was father of her children. So she she would always talk to us and just say, you know, we, we were there for this initial wonderful time in, in Hollywood and it was the golden years and we were the golden couple. and. She she just wouldn't knock him, but 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 I will. I'll knock him. I I, I thought he yeah. I I I didn't enjoy interviewing him, and I mentioned he almost got into a fight during the interview too. So I think I think that's why some people's careers dry up. Um, and there are there are actors that just literally disappear. Mm -hmm. and as I said, you don't really remember them until they die. <laughs> and they're going, oh my God, whatever happened to yeah. you know so and so? But um, it's a tough business too. I mean, you have to you have to not only be good, but I think you also have to be somebody that people want to work. I mean, everyone, no one has a bad thing to say about Meryl Streep. And she's done, she's made so many movies and you know, people just love working with her because she's really easy to work. Uh, Kate Winslet, uh, who, who's not in my book, and I did interview her and she was sort of on the cusp, but then, uh, then I had too many Brits in there and so she, she got cut. But people love Kate Winslet. They just think she's fantastic to work with and um, you know, just just really um, helpful and, and all. so those people tend to have longer careers. Um, th that's that's what I think. I've, I've heard other people say similar things about that. I mean, when they're hot and, and people are going to see their movies, then yeah, of course they're getting cast in things. It's afterwards when they start to go on the slide down that that, that people um, you know that they don't get hired as much. And and uh, and you, I think you could trace quite a number of people's careers like that that happened to so uh on that uh shall we open up any questions uh to uh, our more sort of traditional format here is to discuss the film and to uh, in which i moderate comments and questions about it uh since many of you saw it this week i think most of you did probably uh it's kind of like you know cinema lit homework um is, are there are there comments people want to make about the film? I, I will I will start by saying I was I was struck by its um, its style, you know. And this is a first time uh, fashion designer, first first time as director, and I I was noting his interesting use of color for one thing that he would intensify or desaturate the color in interesting ways. I thought that sort of reflected the um, protagonist state of being at the time. Uh, that's That was certainly one thing. Also just the sheer stylishness of it seemed very consistent with what I would expect a fashion designer turned director to do. Uh, that, you know, this was like the height of 1962 
um, architecture and, and clothing and so forth. Um, but uh, other, other comments about the film, including Colin Firth's performance also, by the way, which was seemed to me deeply committed uh, emotionally and um, um, for that reason, magnificent. Um, I was wondering, one other Sheila. thing I was going yeah. to add that I meant to say earlier about the film, and then I'll be quiet because I've talked quite a bit, but it also had a very realistic portrayal of a friend, friendship between a gay man and a straight woman. Um, these relationships exist in San Francisco. We know, I mean, I know so many people. I've had really close gay friends and, and um, it's just a very special kind of relationship because it's not sexual. So that part of it um, can sometimes cause problems in relationships. So that factor is not there. Um, and I thought, I thought Julianne Moore, although I, 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 her accent was starting to disturb me because of course, Colin Firth was speaking the King's English and, and hers sometimes didn't sound like she was really doing it right. But apart from that, I thought the way they loved each other was really beautifully captured. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that dance scene between the two of them was just knocked me out. That was great. I wondered if that was improvised. Um, yeah. And their, their ability to speak some rather hard truths to each other, I thought, yeah, was yeah. A, a sign of a, a very deep abiding friendship. Yeah. yeah. It's a very difficult stuff, right? I mean, especially when she's basically admitting that she loves him and was trying to sort of minimize his relationship with Jim. Right. Um, right. But uh, yet, Sheila. You're, you're up. Nothing, nothing particularly <laughs> trenchant to say other than the fact that... Um, uh, I'm wondering whether Tom, uh, what's his name? Tom Ford has a future. Um, I thought it was, uh, I'm with you, uh, Matt, on the stylishness, uh, but the styledness, it was almost predictable, right? Yeah. And, um, and for that reason, it was kind of a little flat. I, it, it was, there, um, there were a lot of sort of those, not tropes, but the things that, that are like textbook. Um, for instance, the gun. The gun comes out at the beginning, and we're all tense. Of course, we're waiting for the gun to show up, and that that bothered me. I don't like guns. Um, I thought that Julianne Moore, and I, I have to disagree a little bit. I think they, um, she looked really on the down, the downhill slope. I think it was showing something very pathetic. Um, I like Julianne Moore, by the way, and I agree with Ruth. I didn't care for her accent, um, but. It, uh, it, 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 it was very sad. It just, everybody around them was very sad. Even the next door neighbor, um, the <laughs> colorful little girl, it's just kind of fakey. I guess I just- With a gay brother. brother. The, the poor little boy was like two or three and he was already labeled gay. <laughs> oh, was he? But the yeah. little girl was kind of sinister in a way. So there are a yes, few things are. that, I don't know whether he intended her to be sinister but she'd look at him in this very odd mm -hmm. way and I thought is this going to turn out to be a horror flick so, <laughs> um I, so I think what I want to say is I, I wouldn't see it again if I were given the opportunity I love Colin Firth which is what drew me to it um but as I said I thought it was like too overly mannered uh became overly predictable and in the end was kind of sad in a pathetic way. I, I, and I think that that's not, I'm not sure that that's what was intended. And so then my final yeah. question is, do you think Tom Ford has a, has a future? Well, he made director? one other movie. As far as I know, he's made only one other movie and I'm blocking on the name, although I saw it. Um, it, it, it does somebody remember the name of Tom Ford's second film? He made it about uh, three years after, after did anybody see it? <laughs> It was also sort of spooky. Nobody saw Tom Ford's. And, no. Is that nocturnal? Somebody's got to look it up. Nocturnal on, animal. Somebody has to look it up on one, on one of your little phones there and tell is me it, what the is title it nocturnal, is. Nocturnal animals. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nocturnal animals. Yeah. And that was really strange. I didn't like that one. I liked a single man, but I didn't like nocturnal animals as much as I liked. And then he hasn't made anything. I yeah. assume he's going back to to. He has, he makes beautiful clothes, by the way. If you ever see them on any of these these discount websites and stuff he's <laughs> he, he really well, is a great designer so, so the, with that. i don't know a single I man know. wasn't a single man didn't get great reviews as a film it was really mostly lauded for colin firth um uh, and i think yeah, for some I of the reasons good. that you're talking about sheila yeah. that it's just it's just a little too mannered right i mean the style sometimes seems to take over 
to the point where it misleads us to think that, for example, the, the, the little girl is creepy and she's gonna figure in the plot later or whatever, when that's not really what's going on at all. And, and Matt, uh, there was something else that I noticed last night that I didn't know, pay attention to. I think it's the first time that I watched it. If he was really suicidal, he was that depressed, he was gonna kill himself, he wouldn't be snapping out of it and dancing with Julian Moore and talking to these students and being really clever in his class. And I mean, people who are that depressed that they're gonna kill themselves usually have a hard time getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that, that didn't strike me as being very, very realistic. I mean, he had the gun in his mouth and then suddenly she calls and he's like, you know, making jokes mm -hmm. on the, on the phone. Um, now maybe this was, this was Christian, Christian Isherwood's novel. I don't know. Maybe that, maybe that was the way he portrayed him, but it certainly doesn't fit with the, with my, with the people I've met who've been going through suicidal kind of things there. Um, they, they don't bounce back the way he did you know he did the class yeah. and he, you know so the, and I did I didn't notice that the first time but I definitely did last night I wonder if that's just a, a concession that he felt he had to make in order to make the movie right that that if it was a an accurate portrayal of depression it's pretty depressing he never got out of bed <laughs> right I mean <laughs> No, I know, but, it, but but then maybe the gun scenes should have been not so many of them. It was almost got silly. Yeah. You know, he's got the gun in his, in his and, and then he goes to the gun shop and he buys the ammunition and the guy doesn't say, what, what are you going to do with this gun? That's you know, $2 and 50 cents for you to kill yourself. <laughs> Did any, I felt a little bit, I don't know if cheated is the right word, but I really wasn't very happy with the ending. I thought we're put through all of this. Yeah. Um, he he uh, doesn't kill himself. He's he's saved by the you know the attentions of this young man who sort of I, I'm, I'm thinking, who is a student. That's another he, way in which he gives so him. Creative. But he gives him a reason <laughs> to live and a reason to sort of you know hope for the future perhaps. And then he just happens to have a heart attack that night. I mean, it's just like oh. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I just had a, I had a, narratively, I just had a little problem with that. Yeah. But I think yeah. that was maybe Isherwood's point about, you know, the past and the present and the future, um, which he constantly references, right? He's also, also re he's always referencing past, present and future mm -hmm. um, until George has no future, but. Uh, <laughs> that heart attack, by the way, was foreshadowed from the very outset. People invariably were saying, you don't look so good. Oh, you're, yeah. You're gray. Yeah. And by the way, he was looking gray. Um, Matthew, you already alluded to the fact that that went, went from washed out color to very bright color. But um, no, my husband sat down next to me and he said from the outset, he's very good at this stuff, saying he's going to die of a heart attack. Don't worry about the gun. <laughs> and he was dead right. Right. And, um, and he didn't know the story. He didn't know it at all. No, that's amazing. Well, I see. I went in. I went in the wrong direction when people say you don't look so good. I thought, well, that's because he's suicidal. I mean, you that, know, that's what that, that was. What I thought too. Um, Nicholas Sal, oh, he says, anytime you hear anyone cough, that's it. They're going to be gone by the end. Right. Of the film. <laughs> it's the okay. Minoshka syndrome or something. Oh, and a cough, other, a cough is never just a cough. It's always right. ominous. The other thing that I thought was really dopey was when he opened the back door, this just before he had the heart attack, he opened the back door and there was an owl. I mean, that's like classic mythology. Do you remember oh. that? the owl flies right and it was in the full moon. It was like, this is really cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's part of the sort of artiness of this movie that, that is, doesn't, doesn't set well with, with a lot of folks or, I mean, I think the, the film absolutely rests on Colin Firth, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, without him and without the, the, the intensity and, and commitment of that performance, it would be, a, I don't know, pretty, pretty hard to watch, I think, as a very pretty film, but not necessarily a, a, an emotionally engaging one. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely liked it better the first time I saw it. You sometimes you should see things in films when you watch them the second, I mostly don't see films the second time. But now, given, given all of this time, I have been going back and watching a lot of the classics that I saw many, many years ago. And it's really interesting to get a different 
perspective on I mean, me being older and, and having seen a lot more films since the first time I saw, I can remember movies that I saw in the 1950s, seeing them with my mother and, and then seeing them. I just watched uh, the uh, monkey business with, with Carrie mm. Grant. I remember seeing that with her. Um, so yeah, I mean that actually, I, you know, when, when we think about the good and bad things about having to stay home, um, there's been a lot of really terrific television and there's, there's an opportunity now with streaming. You could, there's almost no movie as obscure as it could be. The other night I watched, because somebody mentioned it and, and I found it on YouTube. Ben Heck actually wrote and directed a film in 1945 called The Spectre of the Rose. Mm. And it is kind of a film noir. It's set in the world of ballet. It's, it stars Judith Anderson and get this, Chekhov's nephew, the real Chekhov, his nephew, Michael Chekhov. Um, you should watch it sometime. Some, we, we, showed it, we showed it. We showed it many years ago. You did. You know it's, the film? At, at, at God, here at Mechanics. Yeah. And it was one of the weirdest films we have ever shown. <laughs> but, but weird in a really interesting way, I thought, didn't you? I loved all that ballet stuff and all the, ha the hands. I mean, he was very visual filmmaker was in there was another thing that that caught my attention because i know him as being a chicago journalist that's where he got his start and when this ballet company is traveling around the country the very first thing you see written on the trunk is chicago <laughs> I, I, I thought oh that's right he put that in for, to, to to show his chicago roots um yeah there are a lot of oh. old movies out there <laughs> I watched, I find myself um, watching things, uh, people that I admire when they die, I'll watch one of their movies in their honor. I haven't decided on my Poitiers movie yet, um, but I watched the last picture show last night in honor of the passing of Peter yeah. Bogdanovich, yeah. which and is- I, I, I watched it a couple of weeks ago just because it was on TCM. It's a wonderful movie. It's, it's really absolutely awesome. brilliant. It has it, got, it it's, it's chock full of more great performances than just about any it, it, film you, you could know, hope it's for. Amazing. It was the second film and then what yeah. after career just kind of it, it, he the, the Clara's Leachman character is just oh I mean just it, she made me cry you know she yeah. and um maybe because I'm closer to her age now than I was when I saw it the first time I can sort of see that young boy you know and uh, yeah so yeah. folks oh uh, Trisha and then we're gonna have to, I guess we'll need to wind up for the evening yeah I just wanted to give a minority report difference to the what the general consensus has emerged that he, a suicide person, suicidal person wouldn't act that way. You know, I've lived in Britain twice and I have noticed a lot of um, witty, cynical remarks sometimes where an American will um, go just quiet down and a British person will, I mean, this is such a gross generalization, but I'm just thinking back to people I knew when I lived in London, there'll be a, a kind of a, a cynical remark and you have to delve to find out what the what's going on. And I, I actually felt that the weirdness of the little girl and the little boy and all that other weird stuff, it's like if you're if you're knowing you're gonna die that you're gonna shoot yourself that day, everything gets so heightened. And it's mm -hmm. so something that like the way the camera came up from the little girl's feet up up her body, it seems so weird. But I think that. I mean, I, I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not suicidal. I never have been. But it just seems like you would become hyper-focused on every little detail of life that would occur that day because you know that it's going to end. So I, I guess I accept it. Important. I, I, got, I know, accepted the, 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 fiction, the, the world of yeah. the story in that regard. It's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, that I, I was also noting, I think that is an interesting point, noting that Firth didn't, the character of George didn't seem to be afraid of scaring children and being a little creepy himself. Right. Um, almost like he's embodying this premonition of, of doom or something. Uh, so yeah, I think, I, I think all of that, it's very, yeah, good point, good point. Um, and so folks, um, I think this wraps up our wonderful um, re, um, <laughs> reunion of the, of the Zoom. Um, Ruth, thank you so much for coming this evening. Well, thank you for inviting me. Hearing us all your, your many and wonderful stories. And why I appreciate your intelligent questions. Uh, we had to get, 
I had to stop and think of, about some of them. Uh, there are questions I haven't been asked, and I've been asked a lot of questions over the last the last six weeks. But but um, got me thinking again about Sophia Lauren and her perfume. <laughs> yeah. And um, Ruth, I want to thank you as well, and we'd love to have you come back. And also, we'll put in a plug for the uh, mostly British Film Festival for that would March. Be great. That, Please that be in touch with us, and we'll we'll spread the word. You know, and, I'll be happy, and I would be happy to come back, uh, especially if we're still on Zoom, or have or have one of my um, the, the two women, one of whom is actually British, who work with me. Uh, and, and I don't know, Maxine thought this is. I don't know if Maxine is actually listening because she said she might she might tune in, but I don't hear, oh, I don't hear her. So maybe not. But but it'd be great if Maxine could come and talk about some of the British films that she chose and stuff. Sure. So so why why don't we try to work that out? Yeah, I mean, do me just be like ten minutes at the beginning of the because I know you guys have a program things that, that you that you right. plan to do for there. But um, well, well, how about yeah. every, how about everybody unmute themselves for sign of just to kind of wave goodbye.